Hi everybody, my name is Katie Maniger and I am the Ohio Regional Rep with Nutrients for Life Foundation and we're super excited to have you here today for our virtual field trip. Our first visit and stop is going to be with Don Tobel with OD Greens Farm. So welcome Don. Thanks for having me Katie. Well thank you for being here, especially with what we have going on outside today. <laughs> it's always sunny here. <laughs> I, I don't know what part of Ohio you're in because it's not sunny here. Um, anyways, uh, thank you so much for being here. I hope you made it to the office okay today. And uh, we're excited to learn a little bit more about your operation today. I think we're going to segue into a little video that kind of shows us a little bit of the behind the scenes of your operation. And we'll go ahead and get some questions afterwards. So uh, kids out there, make sure you type in where you're from and give us some questions so that we can find out a little bit more about Don's operation. My name is Don Tobel. I'm the owner and operator of OD Greens. Uh, we are a veteran owned small business and we use hydroponic farming as a platform for mental health counseling for disabled veterans. Behind me is our actual farm. It's a hydroponic farm that does about two and a half acres of produce in 320 square feet of space and it is a refurbished shipping container. In the cooler here, we have some of the uh, lettuce that we grow. We actually have seven types of different lettuces inside the farm. We have four types of kale, some rosemary, we do microgreens, three types of basil, and a little bit of arugula. And so the farm is divided into two different sections, comprised of 256 total towers. On this side, I have arugula and basil growing, and on my right side, I have four types of kale and the rosemary. And so the towers are removable from the wall here. And inside the towers, there's a small felt strip, which helps to distribute the water evenly through the plant itself. As the water flows down the tower, it's collected by a small trough system here, which returns the water to the main tank all the way to the back of the farm. So there's a small filter system here on the wall, which collects the condensate from our AC unit up top. The condensate comes down this tube into the condensate pump and gets filtered out for any particulate. Inside the farm, we also have a uh, commercial grade dehumidifier, which takes out the condensate from the air. And we actually recycle the condensate within the farm, filter it, and we put it back into the system. So we use about 10% of the water that traditional farming uses. Okay, so inside the farm, we have our LED rope lights that hang down to provide our plants with the light that they need in order to grow. There is a specific ratio of red to blue light to optimize for leafy greens. So you'll notice the magenta glow of the lights. Um, we actually don't heat the farm at all, even in the depth of winter, because the ballasts that control the lights actually throw enough heat to heat the farm throughout the winter months. On the wall here, we have our different types of nutrients, uh, specifically for hydroponic growing. It's a two-part nutrient, uh, and it is automatically dosed with our dosing panels here that use the peristolic pumps, uh, which are under constant monitoring, and the information that comes from our sensors gets pushed to our computer on the wall there, and it lets the, the farm know when to dose the specific nutrients that we have. So we use a two-part nutrient solution, uh, A and B. Uh, there are different compositions in each. This one has 14% nitrogen, uh, zero potassium, and 7% uh, phosphorus. And so the reason that they are separate A and B is that when you mix them together in solution, uh, they don't play well and you'll get a precipitate that comes out within that solution. So I got a whole bunch of jugs on the wall. Effectively, they're the same, but it just depends on what part of the farm you want to feed. So from here over is the main area, and these nutrients, A and B, as well as a pH adjuster and a desalinating solution for the main area. Again, nutrient A, nutrient B, and pH down for the seedling area. 
right, so I do have two dosing panels because there are two distinct parts of the farm, the seedling area and the main grow area behind me. Uh, each one of these panels controls nutrient A, nutrient B, and the pH. I'm taking constant reading of the temperature, the EC, or the electrical conductivity, as well as the pH of the solution. I also have uh, external sensors, so with this one I can take the measurement of the EC by a hand reader and compare that uh, for calibration purposes against my, my sensors which push the information to the computer. And so like any good modern technology, there is an app for that. I can control effectively everything inside the farm, including the lights, the watering times, uh, and, and I can make sure that everything is within the normal limits of the farm right here from the app on my phone. I've been as far away as a thousand miles and still been able to check in on the farm. So while my business has an agricultural component, the true mission of OD Greens is to provide mental health and workplace training for disabled veterans. We just happen to use a hydroponic farming environment to do that. So here in our waiting area, we have coolers that are set up and we take the produce that we grow right here on site. We bag it according to order, we place it in the coolers, and then our customers come in and grab it whenever they want. On the wall over here, we also have locally processed honey, uh, and we have a couple other veteran-owned small businesses who do a little bit of uh, business here with us. Okay, thank you so much for that great video. It was a lot of fun um, shooting it with Don. So we saw in the beginning that it was running a little bit slow. It's kind of like travel on our roads today because we're in the middle of a, a pretty good snowstorm up here in Ohio. So just as we're challenging and going slow on the roads, our video is a little bit short or a little bit slow there in the in the beginning. So Don, do you want to just kind of recap a little bit about um, some of the areas that were being mentioned when we had a, a little bit of the technical difficulties there? Yeah, just remind me exactly because it was glitching. I couldn't remember exactly what I was talking about. Um, it was talking about a little bit about your LED lights and oh, right. why and how you use them and a little bit in your water recirculating. Yeah, yeah. So the uh, the LED lights that we have in the farm, they're strips and uh, there is a specific ratio of red to blue. Um, and in the main grow area, that's going to mimic more of the later summer type of sun. So there's more red to blue ratio in that mix as opposed to uh, in the seedling area where there's more of a blue ratio uh, to, to, again, mimic the earlier springtime sky. Perfect. And a little bit on uh, what you use within your water. I think it's really important the the ratio and how much the farm actually uses and saves compared to traditional agriculture. Yeah. So uh, in, in the video, you guys saw that I had an uh, air conditioning unit. That's the sole temperature control inside the, the farm itself. And so uh, the, the ballast from the lights actually will heat the air. And when you get hot air, it's more able to hold water and that's not necessarily good. So we, we cool the, the air with the AC unit and then we pull that water out with that same unit and collect the condensate, the water that was in the air and we filter it and we put it back into our system. And the same thing happens with our dehumidifier. And so that allows us to kind of work inside this enclosed environment and use much less water than what traditional farming would use because in traditional farming, you're going to lose a lot of that water to the environment and natural evaporation. Great. Uh, students, if you want to go ahead and you know, type in, let us know where you're from. Uh, any questions that you have, make sure you, you throw them up into the chat. We'd love to hear where you're from. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. I have a question. Um, from Jay from Kansas. He would like to know, do you prefer to buy fertilizer from a local source such as a co-op or do you, the, do you prefer to replenish the soil? Um, yeah. Maybe um, a little bit challenging. <laughs> yeah, uh, so it, it's been really difficult to buy fertilizers uh, for hydroponics locally. Um, the the, the nutrients that I do use in solution are pharmaceutical grade, so they are very, very high end types of nutrients. Um, I try not to introduce anything from the outside uh, environment into the farm, again, because we want to maintain that uh, sterility to a point uh, and the cleanliness inside. And we don't want to introduce uh, pathogens and pests uh, that might be uh, coming from outside into the farm. That helps us to not have to mitigate any issues. And we, then we don't have to put any uh, types of pesticide onto the produce itself. So we try to stay as clean as we can with, with all of that. 
Okay, perfect. A couple questions coming in. Um, Haley would like to know, how did you learn how to do this? Um, maybe in a little bit, what, what spurred you on? Yeah, um, I, I think it was just innate interest uh, and, and trying to figure out new ways of doing old things. Um, and so that's kind of the way I'm wired. I'm, I'm a little bit of a problem solver. And uh, my first hydroponic system uh, was actually an aquaponic system. So it integrated fish culture uh, into the water as well. And so we use the fish waste to provide the nitrogen uh, in the solution for the plants. Um, and that was the first uh, system that I built at my house. And I saw that there was an interesting uh, relationship happening there and it was also therapeutic. And so that uh, kind of was an insight for me to start my whole business, which integrated mental health with agriculture. Um, but at a commercial scale, aquaponics is extremely difficult. And so uh, I transitioned over to hydroponics. And that's uh, when I ultimately took the, the big leap and bought the, the container farm that was in the video. Excellent, thank you. Um, we just had a horticulture class from Goose Lake, Iowa, just join us, so welcome. Uh, we have another question coming from Ventura, California. Uh, Mrs. And I, I hope I say this right, Fickenshire uh, would like to know that what the plants we know that plants need sunlight to produce their own food. Can you be successful with hydroponics without a red light? Good question. Yes. Um, so, right. Uh, the plants need the light in order to make their own food through photosynthesis. Um, and in our farm, obviously, you saw the two color lights and you might have only really noticed it as one magenta color. But inside those lights are actually a red and a blue. And I mentioned a little bit in the video about how uh, there are different ratios of each of those to mimic different colors in the sky. And so the light colors that I use in the specific ratios of red to blue are tailored specifically for leafy greens. Um, and if you put this on a whole uh, uh, spectrum plot, uh, you would see that if you want it to flower, then you would need a different ratio of, of red to blue lights as well. So um, I, I'm not really equipped to do flowering fruiting types of plants with inside the farm because that would be a different wavelength of light or a different color of light. Okay, uh, we have another question come in and actually uh, basically the same question from two different uh, viewers. So Mr. Rowley from Michaela, California would like to know how much produce do you grow per year? Um, same question came in. And then also, how long does it take to go from seed to table? Okay. Um, so per year, I'm going to break it down uh, into 50 seconds there. I'm going to go by week. <laughs> and uh, on a weekly uh, scale, we do about 50 to 60 pounds of just lettuce. Um, and so inside the farm, there's 256 towers. We're crop sectioned to have, it is now 36 towers per week. And so within those 36 towers, we've got anywhere between 10 and 12 plants. So that is equivalent of about 50 pounds to 60 pounds of lettuce each week. We have some other stuff as well coming out as the basil, the, the rosemary, the arugula, the kale, and the microgreens. So we're above and beyond 50 to 60 pounds each week. Okay, we have a, another question. Uh, does hydroponics farming produce healthier food than traditional farming? This is coming from Mr. Hubert's fifth grade class at Mound Elementary School in Ventura, California. Lots yeah, that, of uh, West Coast today. Yeah, Welcome, that, guys. And that's a great question. That's one that I get asked all the time. And I was actually working with an organization who was trying to figure that out because we are working in such a controlled environment. Um, they wanted to, again, look at food as medicine and, and say, okay, well, if you have this condition, we can prescribe, if you will, three heads of this type of lettuce and, and look at the, the exact nutrient content of each one of the hydroponically grown lettuces. Um, I don't know that they are more healthy than, than traditionally grown. Um, my advice to anybody is don't uh, back yourself into the corner of eating one type of food. Uh, I wouldn't recommend ever to eat fully hydroponic produce. Um, I wouldn't always recommend eating all organic. I would say get out there and, and, and eat as many different types of sourced food as you possibly can to, to have a variety. I think that the variety is the key to any really good healthy diet. Okay, I have a, a question here from Aiden from Ohio. He would like to know why you monitor the electrical current. 
why I monitor the electric current, the uh, electrical conductivity of the solution, I believe. Um, that is how much of the salt or the nutrient is actually in the water. And so that's how much food you are getting to each of the plants at any given time. So the higher the EC uh, measurement, the higher the amount of nutrient in the water. And there is a specific window where the, the lettuce or the other plants that are growing in the system have to operate within. And typically we're anywhere between uh, like 1450 and 1500, uh, I think it's millisiemens per cubic centimeter on the EC chart. So that's just showing us how much food is in the, the water for the individual plants. Perfect, thank you. Uh, another question, um, it's not saying where from, but we have a Dutch bucket uh, hydroponic system in our greenhouse and have a difficult time maintaining the pH of the water. We are using city water. What pH works best for you? We are growing lettuce, kale, herbs, and spinach. Yeah, I, I'm not real savvy on growing spinach, and it might just be that it's a heavy feeder, but then also you might want to take a look at any algae growth and how often you're replacing that water. The smaller the, the system, the more frequent you'll have to replace that water, um, just because you'll get um, uh, a, a tendency for the pH to, to either decrease or increase. And so with, with my system, I've got 150 gallons in the main area. I rotate or, or turn that tank over uh, every single month. And if you're doing a five gallon Bato or Dutch bucket, um, you, you're probably gonna wanna replace that at, at least every week. So take a look at that, take a look at, uh, at your algae. If you've got a, a lot of algae that can affect your pH as well. All right, thank you, Don. Uh, another question coming in uh, again from Mr. Rowley's class. Do you grow different produce for different seasons or in an enclosed system, does it matter? Yeah, I was joking with Katie earlier uh, because it is always sunny here at, at the farm. It's, it's summer year round. And so I don't really rotate through different types of, of produce. Um, I have a, a customer base and that customer base knows what they want. And so I make sure to provide the staples that, that they're asking for. I'll always be doing experiments inside the farm. So there's usually something new and something different that I can offer just to kind of see what the, the reception is from the crowd. And if it's successful, then I'll, I'll scale it up. And if it's not, then it'll get phased out. Okay, um, quite a few questions rolling through in here. So um, we had one earlier from Tracy from Ventura, California. She wants to know what kind of growing medium do you use to grow your lettuce without soil? So maybe, um, can you tell us, do you start with the seed and then does it go to your mats and how long is that process? Yeah, every, everything we grow inside the farm is from seed. And um, it, I don't know if you can remember in the video, before they get into the towers, which have a foam binder and the felt wicking strip, there is a small plug and that plug is made out of peat moss and a foam binder. And so um, there are natural ingredients in there and then there are uh, man-made ingredients in that plug itself. But uh, everything, again, we do from seed. With lettuce, it's uh, seed to, to table in 55 to 60 days. Um, it's not a, significant, not a significant difference than uh, just growing it outdoors with this current system. I have heard that some hydroponic systems, uh, based upon lighting and efficiency, can actually reduce that amount of time. With basil, you're looking at about 90 days from seed to, to readiness. Perfect. Um, I just want to add in there a plug, no pun intended, that uh, his, his, your greens are fantastic. My dad is not a huge uh, salad eater, especially greens. He's a, you know, old school guy and he absolutely loves yours. So um, very, very tasty. We've got a question coming in from Brian Hubert. What types of plants are best for hydroponics? Are there plants that are not good for hydroponics? Yeah, I, I think with anything, um, there's going to be limitations to one way or one style of growing. Um, and specifically inside my farm, there are plants that won't play nicely with other plants. And so some are going to require a higher EC, some are going to require a lower EC, some are going to need to have a higher pH and vice versa. So you got to kind of look at it from, okay, well, what window of EC and pH and temperature do these plants grow in and figure out, okay, do they fit into the same category or will they play nicely with those other plants that require uh, maybe a little bit different uh, type of environment? 
So I wouldn't do necessarily tomatoes and other fruiting plants, number one, because of my lights, but also because the, the nutrient content and the pH content is going to be a little bit different. So bulk your plants together according to what their EC and pH demands and, and temperature demands are. Um, and then think about what their lighting needs are as well. Okay, uh, again, from Mrs. Uh, Fleckenshire's class in fifth grade, is there anything not environmentally friendly about hydroponics? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, again, with anything, um, there's pros and cons. And so you are constantly making that chart of what is the, 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 the benefit of growing hydroponically versus what is the, the cost of, of growing hydroponically. And so with hydroponics, um, again, being fully indoors and, and self-contained, I do use a lot of electrical uh, energy and a lot of electrical power plants are, are fueled by coal. And so there's that whole, you can't create energy from nothing. You can't create and destroy it. It's just one of these things, but we have to transfer that energy from some other source. And so if my electrical grid is connected to a, uh, a coal plant, or if it's connected to a nuclear plant, then that's how ultimately I'm getting the energy to feed my, my plants inside the farm. Um, with traditional farming, obviously you are using the sun as, as your, um, your main photosynthetic uh, producer there. And so that's going to be much cleaner than any type of indoor grow. And so um, to our defense, though, we also don't apply our nutrients to the tops of the ground. And so we don't lose it into the watersheds, um, especially here where we're at uh, just outside of Cleveland. We have a lot of runoff of nutrients that go directly into the Lake, Lake Erie uh, watershed. And so that can be problematic come summertime when the temperature of Lake Erie increases, then you get these algae blooms and it results in a whole bunch of uh, problems. And so there's, there's good, bad, and ugly with every type of doing this. Uh, again, it kind of goes back to my point I made earlier about not just being fully hydroponic, not just being fully organic, not just being fully traditional, but you know, kind of uh, work on the entire spectrum. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. Uh, we have a question from Susan from Illinois. She asked, what options do students who live in this part of the U.S. have in terms of starting this at home? Uh, and another question with that um, is, how do you treat the substrate initially to contain the chemicals, the fertilizers needed for the plants to grow? Okay. It was Susie that had the, the startup question. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, and, and you can make this as big or small as, as you want. Um, I mean, you can do hydroponics as easily as an avocado seed in a, in a little glass of water on your window. So, I mean, technically that's hydroponics. Um, and, and, and so it is extremely scalable um, all the way to what I'm doing and beyond. I've seen warehouses that are are, are retrofitted with hydroponic growing equipment and they just do an incredible volume of, of produce out of that scale. So that's, I, I think one of the advantages that this has, this type of growing has is that it is super scalable and you can start as small as you want and you can make it as big as you want. Um, the second part question, I think it was uh, about the substrate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, when I get the plugs from my supplier, um, I don't really do much to them. Um, sometimes I will treat them with a, a, a hydrogen peroxide solution just to make sure that any pathogens that are on it, like powdery mildew or molds or, or algae, uh, is not on the plug when it comes into the farm. And so that's just kind of my uh, uh, remedial action on that to make sure that it isn't infecting my farm with something from, again, the outside. And that's just kind of how I sterilize everything from the get-go. Um, but then I will introduce uh, beneficial bacteria, mycorrhizae, and, uh, and some different types of bacterias into the system. Um, you start with as clean of a solution as you possibly can, but sometimes it can be too clean and you need those bacteria to get in there to make those nutrients more usable by the plants themselves. And so we have specific bacteria, specific fungus that have to go into the system, and I add those manually as well. Okay, um, we're going to do one more question, then we have got two others live, um, and then we're gonna we're gonna be heading south to where it truly is always sunny all the time. <laughs> okay, uh, we have a question here. 
from, um, actually, it looks like we've covered most. Oh, here's one. Um, this is from Upper Lake, California. It's Erica. How do you monitor or maintain the health or the biodiversity of your soil or your mats? Yeah, I, I think um, number one, it is constant. We call it scouting. Um, you're looking for pathogens. You're looking for bugs. You're looking for things that shouldn't be there. Uh, you're constantly taking in this data and, and noticing what things don't look right. Um, the more you do it, the more adept you are at noticing something's out of whack. And so it, you can kind of tell, all right, well, if things are getting leggy and they're a little spindly looking, your pH is probably not where it needs to be. Maybe you got to go back through and recalibrate your, your sensors and, and, and take a look at when the last time you turned your tank was and, and go down this whole like uh, dichotomous tree of things that could be potentially wrong. And so that's, that's the key is constantly scouting, constantly collecting data and constantly monitoring what, what things are, are, are going on inside the farm. Okay, I believe that you touched on this just a little bit, but Mr. Rowling was asking, or Mr. Rowley was asking if it mattered what you were growing because it's enclosed. Yeah, yeah. so seasons, I guess- Specific to season. Specific to season. Um, not really specific to season, but specific to space. Again, because I grow uh, vertically in the towers, I can't grow things that are going to get long and, and hanging like tomatoes. I, I wouldn't be able to do that inside the farm because I have a limited amount of space. So we do two and a half acres of, of leafy greens inside the space, but there's no way I could do two and a half acres worth of, of tomatoes or, or fruiting plants inside that space. Okay. So not really related to season, but more related to space and availability. Okay, I would like to kind of close. We have two questions, um, Maria and Anna um, both kind of asked. Maria's from, uh, Cambria, Illinois, and she wants to know how do you use veterans to help you? And then Anna asked, how do you make this therapeutic for veterans? So maybe you also want to just briefly talk about your logo, because I think it's a, a unique logo to that. And I know that this is very much passionate and close to your heart with this. So if you want to go ahead and, and take us away and wrap us up with this, that would be fantastic done. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so my logo, my, my produce logo is uh, freedom served with a fork. And so we've got the cross rifle and fork uh, on our logo there. That, that was uh, something that had to resonate, uh, again, with the population that we serve. Um, and so um, we included those two uh, icons on our logo as well. But um, I'm an Army combat veteran myself. And I noticed, like I said, when I first uh, uh, started into aquaponics and hydroponics that it was therapeutic. And I'm also a licensed professional mental health counselor here in the state of Ohio. And so having an agriculture background, having my military background, and then having uh, my, my master's degree in mental health counseling, all of these things kind of came together like through passion and just uh, prior experience. And I said, well, if this works for me and it's therapeutic for me, then it could potentially be therapeutic for somebody else. And I really do think that veterans themselves are equipped to succeed in agriculture. Um, agriculture and farming is problem-based learning. Okay, I noticed this, what do we do? Uh, what is the, the immediate action that has to be taken in order to address this shortcoming or this, this, this problem that we have inside the farm? And, and so veterans have this way of thinking, okay, if this, then that, and if that, then this. So they, they kind of are trained to follow these stepwise procedures to make sure that they have a positive outcome at the end of the day. And uh, I think veterans also uh, are very team oriented. And so they want to help other people succeed as well. Um, so I think that it is a very, very natural fit for veterans to be involved with agriculture and farming um, as, as well um, because of their, their prior experience and, and their previous training. Well, I, I, since the first time that I met you, I've been intrigued by your operation and your mission and your passion. So thank you so much for your time today, Don. Um, we're yeah. going to go ahead and, and leave our hats and we're going to put on our sunglasses and we're going to head south to Florida uh, to, to visit with our citrus grower there. But um, real quick, I just, I just want to take you guys on a, on a little and a little, not really an experiment, but Don talks about how he also has honey at his shop. And I 
am slightly uh, obsessed with honey. I love it in just about anything. I'll even put it in my coffee, my tea, um, my toast. I love it. So of course I had to buy a jar when I was there visiting with him. So I said tea, I'd love to put it in tea. So I just wanna talk with you guys for a minute. Uh, if I use this same tea bag all week long, how is my tea gonna be? Well, I have here, if you take a look with me, this is from my first tea bag. And this is me using the same tea bag over again. You can see the difference, right? So it goes back to, if you think about what we needed to grow to be able to have the herbs for the tea. So it's the soil and soil health. So if we do not amend our soil and add the nutrients back into it that we take out, just as we take vitamins for ourselves to keep us healthy, we need to do the same thing to the soil. But sometimes we have those challenges where the soil, the nutrients get away from us, literally. And Don talked about that a little bit. He talked about how we kind of struggle here in Western Ohio with our nutrients making it off the land and into our waterways. So if you're interested in that and learning more and discovering the hows and whys, and it's not just agriculture, um, it's what happens in our own backyards and our own lawns and it's some of the activities that we do. You can go onto our website and take a look at H2 No. And basically this is gonna kind of take you on a journey and your class with different activities that you can do. It's a digital case study on harmful algal blooms. So it gives you a little bit more information. So make sure you check that out too, to just kind of learn about the four R's and the four R's are the right rate, the right source, the right time and the right place. And these are all key components to having and keeping our soil healthy. So with that, let's uh, head south. I um, wish I was heading south to actually meet you, Ben, um, and learn a little bit more about your, your production. Although I've heard that you guys' the weather has not been um, so hot either, um, but I'm gonna say that it's definitely sunnier and warmer than it is here. So um, thank you for that. And I do just wanna just real quick say uh, that somebody in the chat said, such a great way to serve and honor our veterans. I love this business model. Thank you for all you do and for your service. So thank you again, Don. Okay, um, Ben, welcome. How is it? Is it sunny, beautiful and warm down there? <laughs> It is now. You're right, though. This past weekend, it, for us Floridians, at least, we had to pull the jackets out of the attic to uh, to stay warm. I was going to say, I saw uh, plenty of pictures of poor little palm trees being covered and poor little citrus trees being covered. And um, yeah. yeah, not good. Definitely a, a scary time. So um, hopefully there'll be some questions on that. If not, I, I definitely want to learn more um, about that. So uh, again, thank you so much, Ben, for uh, being with us today and sharing your passion and giving us a little inside uh, taste of what you do. Um, I don't, I think I speak for all of us that we love a good glass of orange juice or a good old orange. So um, Thank you for, for what you do. I think we're gonna transition over and see a, a little video that you put together, which I have to say is absolutely fantastic. So uh, uh, thank you for your time. Hey y'all, my name is Ben Krause. I'm here in Wachula, Florida, and I wanted to show you around the Krause family orange groves today. Come on. Now let's talk about what an orange tree needs to grow. The first thing is water. Orange trees drink an average of 10 gallons of water a day. Uh, they also need food, and food for a plant is fertilizer. Most of our fertilizers have three main ingredients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Those three things, uh, along with some other spices that we throw in the mix, help that tree grow big and taller than us. So the growing process for an orange from start to finish starts with the bloom. An orange tree blooms and that is the start of the crop that we care for until maturity. The blooms look like this. Come in a little closer, a nice little flower. And even before that, you see we call this popcorn bloom and that's just a bloom that is still forming and it's not quite open yet. And then eventually the blooms set into fruit. This tree's a little ahead, and you can see, look at there, that tiny little orange there. Give it a year and that'll be juicy and sweet and ready to eat. 
So once the tree sets on a piece of fruit, that little marble sized orange that I showed you, um, now the game is on. As a farmer, it's my job to look after the tree and make sure it has what it needs so that that baby orange can become a big, beautiful orange. So one of the things that we're always combating are bugs. Bugs love to eat on these trees and other funguses and bacterias. The biggest challenge we have right now in Florida is a disease called greening. Greening is really tough to deal with. Everybody has it, um, but we do the best we can to care for the tree. Greening enters the tree mostly through these young shoots. That is a brand new orange tree leaf that's getting ready to grow. And there's a bug called a psyllid. And a psyllid, it's like this miniature fly, uh, chews on these leaves. And that psyllid is what carries the bacteria around known as greening. It'll make this whole tree sick. The tree will struggle to produce fruit and it makes it really challenging. But as farmers, we do the best we can with what we have. And we are just thankful that we get to work in the dirt for a living. Coming a little closer. This is a Valencia orange tree, which is most of what we grow on our family farm. Valencias are known for their high sugar content, which makes them very valuable. And they're the primary ingredient in most US made orange juice in America. So uh, Tropicana, uh, Simply Orange, some of those labels that you probably used to seeing in your grocery store come from the Florida Valencia orange. Now they're not quite ready yet. You see the peel still green, which that can fool you sometimes too, just because the peel's green doesn't necessarily mean it's sweet. But I know it's January, and so these need a little more time. Now, as an orange grower, I eat a lot of oranges. Not necessarily because I love them so much, which I do, but because tasting them is one of the ways that you know that they're mature. So I cut them open like this, run my knife around, just like this. See that? And then you get yourself a bite. It's pretty good, but it needs more time. You've heard me talk about water, right? It's very important. The number one ingredient into a healthy orange tree is good irrigation. Now we're sitting here in the middle of a 20 acre orange grove. How in the world do you water all of those orange trees at the same time? You need a big pump like this. This is a power unit. It's John Deere power unit actually. It's connected to a well and it pumps water to the whole grove at a time. I'm gonna crank it up and show you how it works. that orange and blue one right under here it's called a microjet sprinkler as the water pressure builds up in the system that will spray a nice pattern that will wet all this area where the tree's roots are and allow it to drink so what happens when a tree gets green well unfortunately that is the beginning of the end for that orange tree it may still have a couple more productive years but after a while, it becomes more uh, economical for us to get rid of that tree and put in a new one. This is a young tree. But what happens if the whole grove gets green? Well, when that happens, we just have to hit the reset button. And we like to just start over. We have big equipment, a front end loader that comes in. It pushes all the trees up, stacks them, and we burn them and get ready for a new planting. This is a field that was just pushed a few months ago and we'll plant it in a couple months more okay so this is a manure planted grove we've been slowly adding new trees to this grove there's two things i want to show you one you might notice there's something on this brand new tree we call these psyllid bags remember the psyllid that i talked about earlier it's that tiny fly that carries around the greening disease that we're struggling so hard to combat well the psyllid is actually too big to fit through the holes of this bag and so it allows this young tree a head start before the psyllid can attack it to grow big, to grow a root system, and to give it a fighting chance of surviving. One of the other things we love about this bag is that it keeps the deer off of it. Wildlife, you never know what you're going to see in the grove. 
Uh, and they're beautiful. I love it. Every time I see a turkey, a hog, a deer, I take a picture just because I'm so taken by its beauty. But they can cause a lot of damage. And so one of the things these bags can do help us with is keeping the deer from chewing on the leaf. This tree got eaten by a deer. Sometimes the, the, the buck deers, when the antlers are growing and they're itching, they'll come up to these young trees and scratch their head and it'll kill a tree. Every farming operation has to have equipment. And for us, we run John Deere tractors. Let me show you a couple of the things that we use when we take care of our grove. This right here behind the tractor, this is called a disc. Uh, this is what you use to churn the soil. And we typically only do that ourselves when we're in between planting. So the field that I just showed you that we pushed up and are getting ready for new trees to go in, we'll use this disc to churn the soil to prepare it for the new trees that are coming. Another thing we'll use is a mower. Behind this big tractor here, this is a 12 foot mower. It's our standard mower. It fits perfectly between the rows of the trees to keep the grass and the weeds all at bay. The grass and the weeds can cause problems because they compete for the same nutrients, the same water that that orange tree does. So if the trees and the weeds get too big, then the orange tree doesn't have the food, the moisture, and everything else that it needs to survive. One other item we use this is called a speed sprayer. Speed sprayers have a thousand gallon tank inside of them, which we can mix fertilizers and other things that the tree needs, and it delivers it through the air. So as that tractor pulls right down the middle of the orange trees, it's, it's delivering the chemical, helping that tree to go. We've taken care of our orange trees all year. They bloomed, they set a crop, we fertilized and watered them. Now it's time to pick. How we pick them? We bring in harvesting crews and they move through the grove. They have ladders, they climb up to the top of the tree, get every orange and they're collected in a big truck and we call that truck the goat. I have no idea why, but we call it the goat. And the goat gathers up the oranges and then has a big lift bucket. You'll see it in the video. Lift bucket picks it up, it dumps it in the trailer. At that point, a tra the truck driver takes that trailer to the juice processing plant. Tropicana, Florida's Natural, Simply Orange, you know the labels. They make their orange juice right here in Florida. And so each orange is unloaded from the trailer and then it's squeezed they process it and they bottle it and then it heads to your grocery store so that you can enjoy it for breakfast, lunch, dinner, whenever you want. Okay, great video. Again, I wish that I was down there. <laughs> Um, just you could you could feel the warmth and smell it in the air. So uh, good for you, Ben. I'm not jealous at all. <laughs> so I'd love to send you. Do you like white sand? Because I have plenty of white sand outside that I could send you away. Um, okay. Um, thanks again. Um, okay, we've got questions rolling in again. Please make sure you put your your questions, submit them, and let me know where you're you're from. Also, uh, we have Mrs. Fleckenshaw, and I I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, so she has uh, quite a few questions here again from Ventura, California. She said that we live in a drought area. How much water do you use monthly? And he looks as about as frozen as I feel being here in Ohio with what we have outside. So um, I don't know. Um, oh, he's welcome back. Oh, there we are. Yep, yep. <laughs> Part of living in the middle of nowhere is our internet service is very un unreliable. So I apologize in advance if it cuts out. No, it's okay. Um, I think we're all struggling, it seems, with internet lately. So um, yeah. ours has been challenging as well, but I think for other reasons. So um, the question was from Ventura, California. Um, they live in a drought area and they want to know how much water do you typically use monthly? Yeah, great question. Um, it there's a couple different ways to think about that um, because as, as a grower and we grow everything outside, um, uh, we look at it by the acre. Um, and so uh, on average, and depending on the time of the year, there are typical times of the year where we're, we have to irrigate more because it's not raining. And then into the summer months, it rains every day. So we, we hardly ever run the pump. 
Um, but in our driest times of the year, I would say we put between 1,000 and 1,500 gallons of water per acre per month. Um, and uh, we actually have allotments. The, the state of Florida monitors those numbers pretty uh, very closely. We have to report each month how much water we use and, uh, and we can't go over the amount that they give us. The exception to that, which uh, we, we briefly touched on before the video, is in a, in a freeze uh, type event. Um, and uh, I can talk more about this later, but uh, one of the measures that we use to um, help the grove survive freezing temperatures uh, is by basically running the water all night long. Um, and that helps raise the temperature in the grove a few degrees uh, to, give it, to give it a chance. Um, so in, in, a, when, in a month where there's freeze, uh, freeze conditions, um, that number will be higher um, because of those one night, two nights of uh, continuous irrigation. Okay, um, that kind of segues into it. We had a question from Molly um, and I believe she is from Hawaii, I think, if I'm gathering that correctly. Um, her question was, um, what is your most challenging government policy? Um, and I guess I'm wondering, is it the, the water limits um, that you face in Florida? Um, that, 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 the water limits have been around so long that to be honest, everybody's just used to them. And so I, that, that's not where my brain goes first uh, when I hear that question. I, I probably think of um, the, the state of Florida right now is rewriting their uh, nutrient uh, regulations um, and uh, which govern uh, the types and amounts of fertilizer uh, that we use. Now that's not final yet, but um, some of the preliminary reports um, lead us to believe that we, we may have to tweak the way that the way that we do some things. And so uh, the prime, the main thing that, that the state of Florida is trying to protect, and we're totally on board with this, is our water uh, and the aquifers and, and the nutrients um, getting into them. Um, and so they are taking a second look at the rules that have been in place for probably 50 years and just making sure that, that they're doing what we as Florida residents hope they are. <laughs> and so um, we're on board and uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll adjust as that information is rolled out to us. Perfect. Well, and like I mentioned, the H2NO um, digital case study, it does focus on the Great Lakes and Lake Erie, um, but that's a, a challenge across the states, really, um, and can definitely be tweaked and adjusted to your specific classes um, for our teachers that are joining us today. Uh, we have uh, Mrs. Fleckenshire asked again, uh, asked another question, uh, what is your yield of oranges per year? Again, probably the best way to think about that is per acre. And um, we, I would say average, uh, all right, I'm gonna throw some lingo at y'all, but we call it 200 boxes per acre is a good, is, a, is pretty much across the board average. And a box uh, is a 90 pound unit of oranges. So what is that? 200 times 90, 18, is that right? 200 times 90, 18,000 pounds of oranges per acre, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that is a lot. Um, it, it's a lot. Let me let me keep going on that though, because uh, I don't this greening disease uh, from the video. It it really is a big deal and has changed everything. Uh, it showed up in about 2013 in the state of Florida, um, and before greening was here, a grove on average would produce seven to eight hundred boxes per acre. Um, and now because of the disease, we're, we're producing on average 200. Um, so that's a 75% decrease over the last decade that um, we're still trying to wrap our, our minds around, so. Okay, um, that actually, uh, that was a, a second part to a question that she had as well was, how many trees do you lose per year to green? Um, and do you use any sort of pesticides to keep the, the bugs away? Um, and I'm kind of curious too, where, where did the, the insects come from? Do you guys know? Is there a um, natural predator to it? There, there, there are some natural predators, uh, but because the, 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 well, the psyllid, I should say, has been around Florida for, for years, um, even before greening, uh, you could find psyllids in your grove. Uh, but the problem uh, started and greening started showing up in our orange trees 
um, when uh, what we call hot psyllids uh, began being found, which is, is just a psyllid that is carrying the greening disease. Um, and so where the hot psyllids came from, um, a lot of people point to uh, imports and um, you know produce coming in from other countries uh, that it just inevitably is going to have some bugs and, and, and things on it. Maybe it was the, some of the greening bacteria in, in a psyllid that wasn't infected that was living in Florida, you know, to, I don't know. Um, but it definitely came from, from it, it was nowhere to be found in 2012, uh, uh, and, and then it was everywhere in 2013. So it wasn't um, like the, the bacteria came from nowhere. It had to have been introduced from, from a foreign source. So. Is there a specific um, pesticide that you use to try and prevent them or how do you? There's a lot of, uh, yes, uh, there, are, there are several different options you can use. Um, in 2013, uh, when greening was this new hot button thing and um, growers were very concerned about the effect they were having growth, growers sprayed a lot in 2013, trying to kill the psyllid, trying to keep them out of their groves and keep, thus keep greening off, off of their orange trees. We've learned since then that you can't, you can't really keep up with them. They, they reproduce so fast that greening is so prevalent. Now, 100% of orange trees in Florida are infected with uh, HLB greening. And so it, as a grower, you're always weighing the, the effectiveness and the costs. And, uh, you know, we can kill a psyllid, but our trees already have greening anyway. So what are we really doing in the end? Um, and so those sprays have actually been pulled way back uh, because growers have realized that uh, we've kind of already lost that battle. And so we now we just have to learn how to grow a greening infected orange tree instead of try, trying to keep greening off of our orange trees. Okay, um, so, so do you lose a lot of trees to the greening? We do, yes. Um, uh, normal, normal attrition was, is probably between 10 and 15%, I would say, a year. Um, our trees that we're, we, have to, we have to pull out of the ground, burn them, and, and, and put a new one in its place, uh, which is a really big deal for us because in, the life of an orange tree is about 30 years, uh, I would say, of productive life, and which compared to, you know, like a watermelon or a strawberry or something that you planted in the ground, it grows, you harvest it, and then the plant's gone. And then the next year you plant a new plant. Here, we're really trying to keep our tree inventory as long as possible. Um, it's a 30 year investment when you put an orange tree in the ground instead of like a six month or something with a row crop. So uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's another challenge that, that has become normal and uh, we're just doing our best to find ways to keep, keep doing what we do. Well, I, I know that we personally appreciate it. And I can say that, um, the farmers here in Ohio constantly support you guys down south and um, feel the challenges and struggles that you guys go through. So um, don't give up. <laughs> um, so we have Joel Frost from Carson, Iowa. And um, it looks like, how do you irrigate and how long does it take to deliver the 10 gallon per day to the, that the tree needs? Yeah, um, so the irrigation uh, in our groves, we are all on microjet sprinkler. Uh, systems, um, which which you saw in the video, those uh, jets that we have, they're calibrated to put out about 10 gallons an hour. Um, and so uh, we, although because because it would, um, we don't want to tax our pumps. It's hard on the pumps when they run every day. So, so often what we'll do is we'll run it for two hours one day, and zero hours the next, two hours one day, zero hours the next. And that also kind of helps if you think about a tree um, in the wild that's not uh, connected to a to an irrigation man-made irrigation system it's just waiting for it to rain and uh, nine times out of ten it doesn't rain every day uh, and so these trees we're trying to basically mimic what mother nature does um, by water one day no water the next and it, it it helps the tree cycle like it's like it's designed to okay um Mrs. Uh, Fleckenshire is asking, what is the average size of an orange tree um, and of an orange itself? Uh -huh. An orange tree, that varies a lot. And uh, the main driver of that will be the rootstock that the tree uh, was budded to. Um, if, if, 
if I went off track there, uh, most of our trees in Florida, um, they, when a nursery is growing that tree for a grower to plant one day, um, they will grow two trees. Uh, one tree that um, is a, has a specific type of root system and then the other tree uh, that grows a specific type of orange. Um, and then once those trees kind of become little sprouts or seedlings, um, they'll actually cut the top half off of the orange uh, from the orange tree that you want and attach it to the bottom half of the rootstock, uh, the root system that you want. And together you have this a new orange tree. The rootstock though drives what the size of the tree will be. So that was a long way of saying anywhere from uh, eight feet tall to we have trees that are 25 feet tall. Um, and that's all driven by the roots. Okay, the we have a, the orange. A, Go we ahead. Had a, Go ahead. A, a, we had a class that is um, heading out and I'm not sure if they headed out already, but we'll see if we can answer this quick and we can jump back to that one. Um, their question, um, Joel, was what is the investment per acre for an orange grove, um, land, equipment, trees, et cetera? Ooh, uh, it's high, uh, but again, it's a 30, it's a 30 year investment, uh, mind you, but um, I would say probably three to $5,000 an acre, which I know is, is a range, but three to $5,000 an acre you could have. Okay, and one more question for a teacher that's scooting out. Um, if a tree has leaf curl, how do you correct it? Any tricks? Uh, hopefully the leaf curl is caused by the tree is just thirsty. And so you water it. Um, leaf curl can be a sign of many things though. Um, most of which other than the tree being thirsty uh, means that leaf, that leaf has died and it's gonna fall off, so. When we see a bunch of leaf curl, we start watering and we hope that fixes it. If it doesn't, the leaves fall off and you move on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, Becky uh, from Bishop, California says, how many pounds of oranges do you produce on your farm annually? And this is coming from her class. Yes. Uh, so probably around 200,000. Hold on. I got to get my calculator out for this. Um, no, I, that was, I was way off. I'm glad I did that. 18 million uh, would be a rough estimate. 18 oh million goodness. pounds. Yeah, 18 million pounds. That's a, that's a lot. We're, we're growing on about a thousand acres. So, you know, uh, back to that 200 box an acre, 18,000 pounds an acre. So about 18 million. We're really, we're, we're really not that big either. This is a family operation uh, through and through. And so uh, uh, well, that sounds like a lot when you're growing outside. I know I was, uh, watching Don's presentation in the hydroponics and being indoors, um, you're really making much better use of your space where here, you know, you, you spread out instead of up. Okay, um, we have another question from Brian Hubert. Um, what other pests do you deal with? Um, there are uh, funguses. I, 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 group, I group everything as a pest, uh, but funguses of citrus canker is a big deal. Um, we have another one called melanose that, that uh, affects the development of the peel and can, can ruin an orange. Uh, bug wise, take your pick. I mean, Florida is a very subtropical climate. Um, and so uh, if you've ever vacationed in Florida in the summer, you, you get that, you get, you get bugs in your house, you get, you get the mosquitoes are so big, they'll pick you up and carry you away sometimes it feels like. And, uh, um, but uh, some, of the, some of the main ones that, that can cause damage are the psyllid, there's one called the citrus leaf miner. Um, there's a few mealy bugs that we have to look out for. Uh, and then uh, citrus rust mite is the other one that you'll, you'll hear about a lot. Okay, um, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna take one more question. I do wanna let everybody know that we have a, another presentation that's gonna take place uh, noon central time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and we'll be back here again and we can ask more questions. Uh, but we'll go ahead, we'll take one more question for you, Ben. Um, do you use any type of hedgerows or cover crops to attract beneficial insects or to promote biodiversity in your orchards? That is actually a, uh, not a new concept overall, but it is a very new um, uh, concept for commercial citrus farming in Florida. There are some uh, scientists at the University of Florida that have been working on that and they're just starting to roll out their research. Most of what we're finding is there, 
the the benefits of um, the the cover crops or the hedgerows um, and the and the costs there involved for outweigh um, basically what would be returned to the orange grove. And so there aren't many examples of that on a commercial scale um, and we have yet to take that step, but it is something like I showed you that grove that we're replanting um, right now in the video. And uh, it's something that we've been looking really hard at, uh, a perennial peanut, um, which is used, typically used for hay, but it's a good source of nitrogen. We've, we've considered planting in the middle of the rows to uh, to be another source of nitrogen that we don't have to uh, use uh, from the fertilizer plant um, and, and risk it running off and getting into the water aquifer. So. Okay, fantastic. Um, well, Ben, thank you again so much for your time and for taking us on a tour of your farm. It's been fantastic. I know that I've learned a lot and I'm sure that uh, a lot of our students and teachers have as well. So uh, we look forward to seeing you back here uh, in, in just about an hour. So thank you so much. Uh, go grab a nice glass of orange juice. Um, and I think actually I might do the same because I have some of the some orange juice downstairs of some of the places that you mentioned in your video. So um, thank you again and everybody have a, a great day and uh, keep those questions coming. Back.